All right, one of the Young Turks. Awesome show ahead for you guys. Look, uh, they're coming after your Social Security. I hate to break it to you, but I'm going to tell you all about it in just a second. Uh, then in the second segment, that, that's the one you don't want to miss. We have, not only do we have great facts about Fox News, but the Glenn Beck clips. Now, you, you're going to think, come on now, I've seen a million of them. How, how good can they get? Oh, no, this one, I mean, I, it might take the cake, JR. It might take the cake. Okay, uh, it's, it's fantastic. All right, that's coming up in the second segment. Uh, Mike Bloomberg is an American hero, uh, the mayor of New York City. Uh, yes, former Republican, current independent. Uh, another New York politician says something very questionable. That's also very funny. You're not going to want to miss that either. Uh, we have a, a crazy show ahead for you guys. So let's get started, okay? Um, first, uh, they're coming for your Social Security. Alan Simpson is one of the chairs of the Deficit Commission uh, put together by President Barack Obama. Now, as you're going to be able to tell here, Alan Simpson is not a friend of Social Security and does not believe that, you know, it should remain intact. Uh, there's got to be at least some cuts, as he's about to explain to you. Now, he's had some testy exchanges. We've showed you some of that before in a video, uh, and he seems to think, oh, no, no, it's got no money, it's got no money, we got to cut it, we got to cut it. Now, I want everybody to keep in mind what I've always told you. It's an absolute fact. You can look it up. Social Security currently has a $2.5 trillion surplus. Now, the problem is they already spent that surplus on tax cuts for the rich, etc. So, as Simpson's going to explain to you, it's the last piggy bank. That's what I've been telling you. He's going to confirm it. First, He's talking to a woman, a woman from the National Older Women's League. Now, they want to protect Social Security because they're part of National Older Women's League. And he doesn't like what she has to say, so he fires off this to her, which is amazing. I'll give you the exact quote. He says, if you have some better suggestions about how to stabilize Social Security, instead of just babbling into the vapors, let me know. And yes, I've made plenty of smart cracks about the people on Social Security who milk it to the last degree. You know them too. It's the same with any system in America. We've reached a point now where it's a milk, it's a milk cow with 310 million tits. Call me when you get honest work. Okay, so, first of all, you see how he sees Social Security? You're just a bunch of leeches, and you're s sucking off of the Social Security, and you're sucking its tits, right? And, and look at how he views this advocate who's trying to protect Social Security. Go get an honest job, okay? Like, what you do isn't real. And what, what's, he gonna, what's Alan Simpson going to do about Social Security? Of course he's going to cut it. Look at the disdain he has for it. Do you, look, again, I need to clarify this because apparently Republicans, the mainstream media, etc., they don't get it. Apparently the Democrats don't get it either. Social Security is something we paid into. This isn't something where we're asking for a handout, where we're looking for some tit to suck on. Okay, it's our money. We put it in. You're supposed to give it back to us, not rob it. But that's exactly what Alan Simpson plans to do. So now that's quote number one. Now, here's some other quotes. Here is what he has to say about uh, Social Security. Quote, the pig is dead. There's no more bacon to bring home. Huh. What did I tell you? I literally called it a piggy bank, and then it was the last piggy bank that they were going to go raid, right? And here he is saying, oh, the pig is dead, man. We already ate its bacon. We already gave it in tax cuts for the rich. Too bad for you guys who paid into it. Ha ha, the rich got your money. And we're not going to give it back to you. We're going to raise the retirement age. We're going to uh, cut into your benefits, et cetera, et cetera. If that wasn't clear enough, here we go again. Here's what Simpson said. If there's good news on entitlements, it's a growing belief in and around the commission that a bipartisan compromise can be forged on Social Security. It would probably involve another extension of the retirement age, an increase in Social Security taxes for the affluent, and a modest reduction in benefits. Go ahead, you tell me what I told you. That's exactly what I told you they'd do. Yeah, the, uh, the tiny increase on the affluent, tiny, uh, for Social Security. But mainly, I'm going to cut your benefits, and I'm going to raise your retirement age. 
Okay? And what is he telling you? He's saying, oh, we all agree. Well, the president stacked this with 14 out of 18 commission members being uh, conservatives. So <laughs> we elected a Democratic president, right? A one who is now running the 2010 elections on the issue of Social Security and protecting it. But yet, his commission apparently all agree, oh, we will cut the living hell out of your Social Security. Fantastic. No, not on our watch, man. Look, this is the one thing that the Democrats won on when they were fighting against Bush. Bush went to privatize Social Security, and the resounding answer of the American people was, hell no. That was so loud and sharp and clear, even the Democrats fought. They were like, oh, wow, Jesus, okay, all right, okay, we'll fight, okay. And that's the one thing they beat Bush on. Now, a Democratic president is going to try to do that? I got the same two words for you. Hell no. That is your money. You put it in. They don't get to steal it. Now, uh, of course, uh, all of his good counterparts over there uh, agree. The co-chair, who's theoretically a Democrat, Erskine Bowles, used to work in the Clinton administration, he says, quote, reigning in the rest of the government is also on the table. Oh, are you not merciful? Are you not merciful? After we cut the living crap out of your Social Security, uh, then we'll look at the rest of the government. Now, look, when you look at the rest of it, I, I'm actually mildly encouraged. You know me, I keep it real. Well, I tell you what's in the news. I, I'm not trying to spin it in any way. So they say that they are considering cuts in defense. I'll believe it when I see it, but at least they're talking about it, so that's positive. That's usually a prelude to including some cuts in defense. If they were bold, I'd be shocked. You know one of the guys on the deficit commission? Um, the CEO of Honeywell, a defense contractor. <laughs> you think Honeywell is going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's slash defense spending. No problem. My guess is no, but hey, hey at least it's on the table. They also uh, want to go after your home mortgage deduction, deduction for employers who pay parts of our health insurance, and deductions for charitable contributions. Now, a lot of you are going to hate that, right? Home mortgage deductions, are you kidding me? That affects so many Americans, and they're not going to be happy to hear that. Charitable deductions doesn't seem like a pleasant thing to cut, etc. But you know what? I'm actually mildly encouraged by that part because it shows you that at least there are more things on the table than just Social Security and Medicare. That might be the heart of what they cut, but they're at least having a conversation. Wait a minute. Did I mention tax increases? Huh, no, I didn't. That's weird. Now, <laughs> huh. <laughs> now, look, it's possible that they do tax increases, and what they talked about was under Clinton, both revenue coming into the government, meaning taxes, and the spending of the government uh, were about 21% uh, of GDP. And Bowles says that he'd like to get it again to that same proportion, where their balanced budget, they're both about 21% of GDP. Uh, under that scenario, would they have to raise taxes? Probably in some areas, right? So despite all of the, the things that we're seeing in the press t about what this commission is going to do, don't get me wrong, when they release their actual report, I always have an open mind. If it turns out that they were at least fair and they cut things across the board, or they also raised taxes, or they cut defense spending, all right, well, I'm going to tell you that part of it. But look, I I'll be honest with you. Now, they're going to call me an ideologue. They're going to say I'm partisan. I don't know what they're going to say, right? But I'll tell you what, they can do all that. If they come to cut your Social Security, I'm still going to say no. Oh, you're not fair. You don't compromise. You don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're not practical. You're not pragmatic. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with that. No, Social Security was a promise that they made to, to all of us, that if we paid into it, we would get the money out, not that some politician would spend that money on wars and tax cuts and then say, I don't have it. So to me, that is non-negotiable. So if they come in here saying, I'm going to cut people's Social Security, I say dead on arrival. No. Uh, I, I couldn't be any clearer, right? So now, will the Democrats have that line? <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that. that. My guess is that is not how it's going to proceed. I could be wrong. All right. Now, uh, do I have Pat Toomey here? Or Jesus, you still have Pat Toomey. Oh, you got it? Okay. Then I'm going to give you Pat Toomey in a second, because the Republicans, they're coming for your Social Security, even though they claim that they're not, right? Yeah, we'll get to that. So now... Uh, but, okay, now, I, you know I beat up on the Democrats, but let me, give, let me give them a little bit of credit here, okay? Because I was surprised by this, honestly. The CBO, it's Nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, they run the numbers. Look, I, I, I generally trust them. 
sometimes they come up with numbers that I'm not that happy with, but it is what it is. Numbers are numbers. They, so now you can disagree, and they're not. You know, they don't. The numbers don't come down from heaven. They're you know they're doing calculation, and they could be wrong. But generally speaking, they have a very good track record. So uh, they evaluated how well the stimulus spending is doing. Is it adding to the economy, et cetera? And you know, I have my own doubts about the stimulus spending. I, you know, I'm I don't I'm not in the same camp as the liberal economists like Paul Krugman who think it was great and who we th thinks that we need more, right? I, I, I feel that it's a little bit more mixed. But I could be wrong and look at these numbers. Uh, they say that the CBO says that real GDP growth due to the stimulus went up 1.7 to 4.5 percent. Now that's just that's not what it went up period. That's what it went up extra because of the stimulus. That's pretty impressive. That, that's a really solid number to the point where, I, as I explained to you, I'm surprised by it. How about extra economic activity? So they, you put in the stimulus uh, money, how much more did you get out in stimulating the economy? Well, the CBO estimates that we got an extra $200 billion pumped into the economy. So that's the economy, it, that's the multiplier effect in, in essence. Not bad, not bad. And then the one I'm most surprised by, Extra jobs uh, in the second quarter of 2010 alone was 1.4 to 3.3 million. That's a lot of jobs added from the stimulus package in just one quarter. They say that if you also include people who went from part-time jobs to full-time jobs, that number jumps out to 4.8 million dollars. Now if they're right about all this and we didn't do the stimulus spending, well then we'd have you know, 4.8 million less jobs, which sounds so devastating, I can hardly believe it. And we'd have $200 billion less circulating the, in the economy. And we'd have, you know, uh, anywhere from 2 to 4.5% less growth. Man, if, if the CBO is right about this, the stimulus did a hell of a lot more stimulating than I had imagined. And those are some pretty devastating numbers. Politically speaking, now, the Democrats should go nuts over that. They, they should celebrate that to no end. They should make ads about it, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, the Republicans will just say they don't believe it. Uh, honestly, the numbers are so good, I'm not sure I believe it. But, but wow, okay, if, it, it makes me think maybe Krugman was right. Maybe Dean Baker is right. Maybe we do need a second stimulus because of that multiplier effect that they talk about so much. So now, of course, if we do, then I, down the road, we have to cut the budget or raise taxes more in order to balance it eventually. But you know me, I got no problems. So I'll cut defense and I'll raise taxes. I mean, look, well, one last thing on this. People are uh, discussing which way the tax cuts are going to go. So Bush tax cuts expiring. Let me just remind you real quick again, overall $3.8 trillion dollars those tax cuts would cost the budget in the next 10 years. About 700 billion of that is for the top 2%, but 3.1 trillion, the larger amount, is for the rest of us, right? You know what? I'd do a second stimulus right now. If it's getting these kind of good results, I'd concentrate it on the energy sector, I'd concentrate on uh, getting jobs uh, in, uh, pumped into the economy, and then say, all right, no more tax cuts for anybody. And those Bush tax cuts didn't do the economy any good, and uh, we're going back to the Clinton era tax rates, which were fantastic for the economy. So I see that as a win-win, and we save $3.8 trillion. Now, one last note on this. It's actually from one of our listeners. Tony Daughtry wrote in on this. He just had a really good point, so I wanted to share it with you guys. He said, look, if the Democrats had any political sense, what they would do is bring this issue, because right now the tax cuts are set to expire if they don't do anything, right? But he's saying they should bring a bill before the elections. Why? Because if they do, the Republicans will filibuster it and thereby kill the tax cuts for everybody else if the tax cuts for the rich are not included. You understand? So if you bring the bill now, you get to beat up the Republicans saying they're against tax cuts for the rest of us, which would be true, which is politically you know, a very smart move to make. In fact, Tony says they're politically, you know, let's say negligent if if they don't do that and of course the Democrats are one other reason which Tony didn't mention but I'll throw in uh, as to why that's a good idea is look you have much larger numbers in the House and the Senate now than you're going to have after the election likely right 
So why don't you get the tax bill that you like right now instead of waiting till after the election? And the answer to all that is probably twofold as usual. One, they're scared. They're like, oh, taxes, I don't know, they're going to beat us up. Oh, let's not do anything. Usual democratic nonsense. And number two, do they really want the tax cuts for the rich to go away? Maybe yes, maybe no. Now, remember, you have a lot of conservative slash corporatist Democrats who are with the Republicans, who are saying, no, 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 uh, we want the tax cuts for the rich. Okay, so <laughs> there goes that. <laughs> Actually, as I was telling you that story, I thought, oh, boy, they're going to get the tax cuts for the rich. They're going to wait till after the election, and then they're going to say, oh, the Republicans, there's too many of them now. Oh, they twisted our arm. Okay, here you go. Here's $700 billion. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. Be fair to the Obama administration. They appear to be fighting hard on that one. Okay? Now, let's take a quick break, and uh, we'll, I'll, get, I'll probably get you to me, uh, just give you a sense of what the Republicans today think about Social Security. But we're going to come back with Glenn Beck. It is awesome here. Come right back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, by the way, in the second hour, we have found a new sexual fetish. And this one, again, is so bizarre. <laughs> okay. Though one might wonder if I have it. Interesting. All right. We'll get to that in the second hour. Now, uh, back to Social Security. Uh, Pat Toomey is running uh, for Senate in uh, Pennsylvania. He's actually got a slight lead right now over uh, Sestak. And he's a Republican, of course. And uh, he's always been very proud about being in favor of tax cuts for everybody, uh, including the super rich and uh, for the idea of privatizing Social Security. I have quotes for you. On tax cuts, he said, quote, I was the one who led the fight for President Bush's tax cuts, and I'm pleased that they helped stimulate our economy. We must stay the course on reducing Americans' tax burden. I, that's not how I recollect things are happening, but okay, so that he's definitely in favor of that. Now, more importantly on Social Security. Uh, now, here's what he said earlier. Quote, I've been arguing for many years in favor of Social Security personal retirement accounts. That basically is privatizing Social Security. He continues, we must make meaningful reforms to Social Security to ensure its future solvency and to enable Americans to accumulate savings. I'm thrilled that the president is taking up this critical issue. That was back when uh, George Bush was trying to privatize Social Security. So there's Pat Toomey saying, I am thrilled that he's trying to do this and I believe in the concept of these personal retirement accounts. That's the language they use for privatization. Now, he's in the middle of a race, as I just told you, and all of a sudden that's a little inconvenient for him. So instead, we're going to get this answer, clip number three. Um, you continue to favor privatizing Social Security. Uh, I've never said I favor privatizing Social Security. Oh, it's never. A very misleading, it's intentionally misleading term and it is used by those who try to use it as a pejorative to scare people. So let me talk a little bit about Social Security. Uh, because anybody who is honestly looking at our federal budget knows that the big entitlement programs drive the budget and that we are on a completely unsustainable trajectory. So what I have said from the beginning Liar. for more than 10 years is first and foremost, everybody who's already retired or near retirement has to get all the benefits promised with no changes, no questions, no interruptions, nothing. I, you know, I've got a mom and a dad who both rely on Social Security. My dad just turned 80 years old. And I'm planning very, very post. important program for senior citizens across the country. And anyone who would suggest that I would do anything to jeopardize or in any way undermine the benefits for those who are already retired or near retirement is being dis dishonest. That being said, that doesn't mean that we must perpetuate exactly this structure for future workers and for very young workers. So I've advocated that we consider offering young workers an alternative, a reform within Social Security that would give them the opportunity to take a portion of their payroll tax and actually save that and own that and allow that to accumulate over the course of their working years and for that to provide a portion of their retirement benefit. I think that would be a very constructive reform and, uh, and that's what I'm that's what I'm going to advocate. In other words, he's for privatization. He just said it again. He said, well, you know, if you're 80 like my dad, all right, am I not merciful? I'm going to let you off the hook, okay? But for younger workers, uh, for that being said, for the younger workers, I'm coming for your money. I mean, I think it's a fantastic idea if we do uh, allow you to invest that money. Right, right, right. You know what Pat Toomey was before? 
he worked on Wall Street and he was a investment manager. So he would stand to and his banker friends would stand to make a tremendous amount of money turning that social security money around for you and charging fees, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm sure Pat Toomey doesn't keep that in mind at all. He's totally objective on this. So uh, how about his brilliant plan? Would it have worked? Well, if you were going to retire in uh, uh, 2008 and Bush had actually succeeded in privatizing Social Security and setting up these accounts that uh, Mr. Toomey's talking about, the average retiree would have lost $26,000. Does that sound like a good plan to you? Now you say, hey, look, at other times you might have gained. That's fair, right? But that's the whole point of Social Security. We don't want you gambling. This isn't time to gamble people's life savings as they're about to go into retirement. Hey, congratulations, you made a nickel and a dime. All right. Oh, sorry, you're about to go into retirement when you just lost $26,000 on average. That's a disaster. And that's a disaster for you. But to me, he makes more money and his former company makes more money, his future company is going to make more money because you know how this, that revolving door goes, and all of his friends will make more money. But that's okay, they're the richest people in the country. What did I tell you? They're coming for your social security. And by the way, in Pennsylvania, you're going to vote for that guy? Over that, you're going to vote for that guy. Are you mental? <laughs> Come on. Crazy talk, okay? So, uh... And, and that's why Democrats, man, sestak has got to do better than this, man. Come on. What to do? You take them out of the office and hit them with a stick a couple of times. They will do. It's, do you guys have any sticks? Let's go up and at them. The only guy so far who's beaten them with a stick, super ironically, is Harry Reid. He ran another ad. I don't have time for it. But he ran another ad against Sharon Angle where he's like, what's the stick? Horse bloom. Soup wax. I mean, he is throwing her from one side of Nevada to another, and that's why he went from down 11 to up 7. Think about it, okay? <laughs> All right, so now, on to Fox News. Uh, John Stewart did a brilliant segment about this Park 51 project, what the Fox News people call the Ground Zero Mosque. And he pointed out, hey, the funders of this, as they said on Fox News, the funders of this project, well, they're from the Kingdom Holding, Holding Company. They're a Saudi company. And God knows where the funding for this radical mosque is coming from. The Kingdom Holding Company is, you know, uh, also a Wahhabist, and they give money to radical Islam. What, of course, they didn't point out, what John Stewart pointed out, is that the guy who owns the Kingdom Holding, Holding Company is uh, Saudi Prince al Waid bin Tal'al who is, of course, also the second largest shareholder in News Corp. So right after Rupert Murdoch, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal is the guy who signs the paychecks for Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, Greta Van Susteren, etc., etc. He's their boss. Funny enough, they neglected to mention that in the segment that they did on Fox & Friends. By the way, as I look at this guy, I'm like, wait a minute, he reminds me of somebody. And then I got it. Father Sarducci. <laughs> you guys remember him from Saturday Night Live? <laughs> from like back in the 1980s? You know, uh, all these days you just need three miracles and two card tricks. <laughs> Something along those lines. <laughs> all right, anyway. So Father Sarducci also owns Fox News, <laughs> funny enough. And guess what was happening as this whole thing is unfolding? News Corp executives went and had a sit-down meeting with the Kingdom Holding Company. They're the principal shareholder of the Rotana Group, which is the media group in uh, the Middle East. Uh, so there they are, <laughs> the News Corp executives with the Saudi princes. So now Prince Al-Walid owns 7% of Fox News, but actually News Corp also owns 9% of the Rotana Group. That's the media company under the Kingdom Holding Company. And they're thinking of extending their ownership there to 18%. So they could not be more in bed with what Fox News is described as these Wahhabis, these radicals, these Saudis. Oh, I can't believe it. So I guess if you know we should ban the mosque near Ground Zero, we should ban Fox News from New York, from Manhattan. Maybe they should get kicked out. Certainly, no Fox News employees anywhere near.
ground zero. You know, I already have the uh, Glenn Ben back, uh, Glenn Beck ban, I should say, on ground zero. I can extend it to all Fox News employees. Just coming up with ideas here. All right, so uh, that, and I just, and if you haven't seen that John Stewart thing, go online and check it out because it's awesome. Okay. Now, back to Glenn Beck. Uh, my friend uh, Glenn Beck is apocalyptic, right? He is all worked up, and he thinks we're in all in a lot of trouble, and he loves to rant about it, and he's just going to bring God into this. I need you to, we're going to show you a bunch of clips, and they're all fantastic, but wait till the last one, because the last one is gold. Okay, so let's go to the first one here, uh, clip number six, about the MLK speech. I am not right. I'm writing bullet points of a speech, and um, uh, you want to talk about uh, trust in the Lord. Um, I know that people are going to hammer me because they're going to say, well, that's no Martin Luther King speech. Of course it's not Martin Luther King. You think I'm Martin Luther King? You think I'm a... Uh, Martin Luther King only delivered the probably the most important and the best speech ever delivered in American history. I mean, it's up there with a Gettysburg Address for the love of Pete. But instead of going for a speechwriter or anything else or trying to write something very eloquent, I am only writing a few bullet points. And I am uh, doing that so I don't get in the way of um, the spirit in case he wants to talk. And I, uh, I would just ask that you would pray for me. You want to talk about a risk. Um, if you would just pray that I would be able to hear um, because sometimes... Uh, Sometimes he's screaming at me, and I still can't hear it. So, of course, he's referring to the speech he's going to give this weekend on the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial, which he says was a coincidence. I love everything he said there. First, do you think I'm Martin Luther King? I was thinking, no. I don't think anybody thinks that. Okay. And he says, for the love of Pete, I'm not. Who's Pete? Okay. Anyway, so, but the last part was great. Did you understand who he was talking about? He said he's going to let the spirit talk to him. That's why he's only writing bullet points. So apparently the spirit, the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ, is going to speak through Beck. And sometimes the, the spirit speaks to him, but Beck doesn't listen well enough. Well, he should. You know why? Here's what the spirit's telling him. Get out of here! <laughs> Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! But he's not listening to the spirit well enough. This guy, I mean, get a load of him, man. If you're a religious person, you're a Christian, aren't you offended by that? This guy thinks that, what, Jesus Christ speaks through him? All right. Look, maybe I'm being unfair. You say, you know, sometimes the Spirit speaks through people. That's just a way of saying things. Okay, fine. Let's go on to the next one, see if it gets any better. Uh, now he's going to get more apocalyptic, and he's going to talk about God more, but also blood more. Let's check it out. As I stood at the Lincoln Memorial the other day, and I, I read the words, what I saw on the wall. I'll read his exact words, but in a nutshell, God will wash this nation with blood if he has to. But he doesn't have to. Oh, thank God. He doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be this way. There are forces that we are, we are not fighting against Barack Obama. We're not fighting against the really? Democratic Party. We're not fighting something that simple. Oh, how I wish we were. We're not. I told you after September 11th, there is a perfect storm formulating, and it is here. And I have begged, if you, if you listen to me, as the market started to melt down, I told you, I begged you then, please, Please get off of this party thing, please. And let's have real conversations. For the love of Pete, let's please come together. Why? Because I said at the time we are passing all of the exits. Gang, there is one exit left. There is one exit left, and it is God. Mm. Everything that is coming our way is too big to handle on our own. If we do not put God at the center of our own personal lives and the center of our country, we will not survive. The country will be washed with blood, and then someone will have to start over. And God only knows how long that takes. 
All right, first of all, the, this country will be washed with blood is just a horrible thing to say uh, on national air. I mean, you're encouraging folks to do crazy things. I mean, and it, it's, it's crazy, and that part's not funny, okay? But the rest of it is hilarious. You know, I wish we were fighting against Obama or the Democratic Party, but it's not that simple. We're fighting against something larger. What is that? What are we fighting against? What? I mean, he keeps talking about God. So what, are you fighting against evil, Satan, bankers? Who are you fighting against? Right? But he never explains. Well, he's going to explain a little later about God. Uh, he says, listen to me. We're out of exits. We're at exit 16A on the turnpike. we got to go on the Lincoln Tunnel. We have no more exits. Actually, I think it goes all the way to 18W because you can take the George Washington Bridge. Anyway, so th that leaves me with the central question of, okay, I, I, I'm not a religious person, so I don't understand. You know, he says, that's it. The only answer is God. But then I wonder... What does God want? I don't know. I can't talk to God. I don't, I'm not like Beck. I, the Spirit doesn't talk through me. So it's easy to say the only answer is God. You get a lot of people who agree with you. But the question is, what does the Picard want? <laughs> what does God want? I don't know, right? But don't worry, because Glenn Beck's going to tell you, and you're going to love the answer. Last clip. Our sponsor, this half hour is Goldline. What? I want you to read the headlines today. Listen to this. I want you to read I want you to read about the stock market. I want you to read about housing sales. I want you to read that in the last 30 months we've added 4.4 trillion dollars to our debt. I want you to read up on the Weimar Republic. I want you to read about Oakland. What? I want you to I want you to just look at the newspaper and ask yourself which politician is it that will pull us out of this. And then I want you to ask yourself you have faith in man or in God? If you put your faith in man, God bless you. I can't wait to see the solution. But if you don't, I ask that you would consider it's not right for everybody. And I don't buy it as an investment, although it has been the best investment I have purchased. I ask you to look at gold as a relief valve, as something that in case inflation comes, it is always the the flight of, of last resort, it is always the hedge against inflation. I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. But I would ask that you would consider your options and call Goldline. Oh, that was awesome. Man or God, which one is it going to be? If you put your faith in God, you must buy gold. So we figured it out. It turns out God does have a message. It's to visit uh, Glenn Beck's sponsors. <laughs> okay, it turns out God loves Goldline. What a huckster this guy is. Gets everybody worked up, all oh, washed in blood and 4.4 trillion in Oakland. Okay, <laughs> and the Weimar Republic and the Nazis are coming, and then so what's the answer? Goldline. <laughs> Pay me. <laughs> Snake oil salesman. On the other hand, he could be right. You know, I was talking to God the other day, and you know what he said was the answer? Netflix. Go to netflix.com slash tyt, and God says you get a free trial membership. You know, those movies, they make the time go by and make you feel a lot better. <laughs> get a load of this guy, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> so please tell your family, friends, everybody you know, this guy's the biggest fraud in the history of mankind. He thinks God should, wants you to buy gold and other sponsors of his program. What a joke this guy is, man. Don't believe a word of what he says. Now, what's driving me crazy as I listen to all this nonsense is that you and I know that there actually, I think you know, some of you might disagree, that there actually is going to be a second crash, right? I think it's going to be pretty damn bad. A lot of the economists think it's pretty damn bad, right? And, and when it happens, Beck's going to come out and say, see, I told you so. Oakland, why my republic, gold line, right? And I was like, no, no, that's not what happened. 
What happened was we did derivatives gambling. We didn't put the money into the economy. We put it into gambling on Wall Street. What the hell does God and Goldline have to do with this? He says, did you ask to put your faith in man? Well, I don't, yeah. I mean, I want us to pass reasonable, logical laws so we don't have these problems and we don't have the crash. Not because, uh, my answer isn't, I don't know, what does God say? Goldline? Netflix? Go Daddy? Okay, no, let's pass reasonable laws. And, and so, he's, so that's why I tell you, look, that's so important. When that crash happens, you're going to have the country split, right? And you're going to have people who are going to listen to the Glenn Becks of the world. And we're going to go, if they win, we're going to keep going in the wrong direction. And I'm not sure we ever recover. That's why it's so important to get the opposite message out. I mean, look, we do that on this show, right? But I, I do it on TV whenever I get a chance, et cetera, because we have to be ready. Otherwise, they're going to win that propaganda war, okay? And they're going to head us off a cliff. And they're going to say, oh, no, the answer is give more money to the bankers, give more money to the rich, more tax cuts, more gold line, okay? And then you crash after crash after crash. So we got to swing the country. We got to swing the country. Let's go. And if that has nothing to do with our sponsors, we're just trying to tell you what's actually happening. Jesus. All right, look, I got to take a break here. But when we come back, some of the disastrous results of this goading people against Islam, et cetera, okay? And, and then, oh, Governor Patterson, what have you done? All right, we'll show you that. Young Turks. All right, back on TYT. Uh, we had a great and fun hour ahead for you guys here, uh, including a new sexual fetish that I did not know about. Right, that but, sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> well, yeah, and I might suffer from it, so we'll see. All right. All right, so, uh, but first, uh, we start with something slightly political. We do, we do. We start with Letterman. Uh, during his last monologue, he gave Barack Obama a tough time uh, in regards to his vacationing. Yeah, he gave him a little zinger here. Mm -hmm. Let, let's check it out. You know who else is on vacation? Uh, President Barack Obama. And this is his, uh, since he's been in office, this is his sixth vacation. Yep, yep. he'll have plenty of time for vacations when his one term is up. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Plenty of time. There. But they're, uh, they're vacationing at the beach. He's down there with Snooky, J. Wow, and the situation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 63. I never thought I'd have to say Snooky, J. Wow, and the situation. Sorry, it's kind of <laughs> Okay, the Jersey Shore joke was a little lame. Okay. No, 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 but that's, look, that's all I got out of that. Like, the zinger on Obama was a little ha ha, but that entire thing as a whole was so lame. It amazes me how unfunny late night is. I was just going to say that because it's such a, it, a five year old can write that joke. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest name in news right now? Whoever we're talking about, I say, oh, and by the way, they're hanging out with. It's not even a joke. It's just, oh, and they're hanging out with. What? Yeah. What is that? What? How, why, what? why is that funny? <laughs> why is it even clever? Why? Yeah, you know what? It's like, look, I haven't put any thought into it, but JR's right. It needs a turn, right? I mean, think like, well, Barack or Pre President Obama, the situation for you might be one term. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Something. I mean, I'm just. You know what I'm saying? A turn, something. It, it, rhyme with Snooky. I don't know, right? But just saying, oh, Snooky and yeah, uh, they're on vacation. Ah, ah. Okay, Hawaii Shore. I, I don't. Something. Give me something, right? right? All right. Anyway, uh, but that was interesting to me because so he's throwing a zinger at the president, but it ain't because he's a Republican, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows Letterman is definitely. A liberal, right? Which, you know, overall is a great thing. And I think he was coming at him from the professional left. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he has lost hope. Yeah, that's the sense I got from Letterman there. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, the jobs are a disaster, econ economy's a disaster. You know, why don't you go on vacation for the sixth time? And you know what? He makes a good point, too. Mm -hmm. And you know me, I, I got issues with Obama, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? Put that aside. Just looking at it objectively. Six vacations? Yeah, that's a lot of vacations. But at the same time, he has the hardest job on, on the planet. Okay, he's the president of the United States. And, like, when I, I started thinking about his six vacations, and I'm like, okay, 
social workers have a really difficult job. And you know, when they're going to school, one thing that they're taught is self-care. In other words, a, a lot of times you've got to take a step back and just think about yourself and take yourself away from all these stressful situations. That way you're motivated to do a good job. So you know, maybe little mini vacations is okay for the man who has the hardest job in the world. Okay, and, and that's me playing devil's advocate. Okay, now, uh, look, I'm all about self-care. Okay. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, look, he's nowhere near Bush's record. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bush shattered all the records. And when Bush went on vacation, it wasn't like, hey, it was extended weekend or something. It wasn't like a week like Obama takes. He's like, no, I'll see you guys in a couple of months. I mean, like, he takes French vacations, <laughs> right? I'll see you next year kind of vacations, mm -hmm. right? Remember, before 9-11, he was sitting in Crawford for a month. Mm -hmm. CIA gives him the briefing. This is the famous thing. Grayson talked about it on the show. He's like, oh, here's the pr briefing, Mr. President. They're going to attack us. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You covered your ass. Go home. Come on. I got some brush to clear. Okay, so he, Obama's nowhere near that. But, uh, you know, and I know he's young. He's got a family. He's got to take care of his family. I don't know, man. Mm -hmm. It just feels a bit much. That's all. Not too much, just a bit much. Yeah, and I don't know what the specifics are for his vacations. Like, I don't know how long they are. I don't know where he goes. I mean, like, I'll take little mini vacations where I go away for a weekend. So does he take little mini vacations, and are those ca counted as, you know, it, terrible and extravagant? <laughs> no, no, you're right. Look, and we probably should look into it a little bit more because I don't think they're counting the Camp David away for the weekend kind of thing. Uh, if they are, then I'm going to give them a, a pass, mm -hmm. right? But my sense of it is that he's taken, like, six significant vacations like almost a week long uh etc so look the thing that drives me crazy about the presidency and this is part of the reason that i like clinton is that if i was a president i mean my god I, I wouldn't sleep for however long you know the four years because i'd be like it's the most important job in the world everything matters and i can't you know they bush was enormously nonchalant about it of course famously nonchalant well, yeah, you know, I'm a manager, and my job is to uh, make decisions, right? Uh, but to me, I, that's why I'm back in Letterman here. I get a rough sense that, oh, it's not fair to say Obama's nonchalant, but he has an attitude of like, oh, I'm doing my uh, macro management, okay? I do this, I do this, I go to Hawaii, I come back. I want him to sweat it a little bit more, right? I hope I'm not being too unfair, because I don't like it when you nitpick on things that are personal, et cetera, right? But I'm just not getting the right vibe in that in that sense from him. Like, you know, like he took so long to make the Afghanistan decision. People are like, wow, I feel like he should take that long to make every decision. Mm -hmm. You know how I like to get options, right? Oh, if I was the president, I'd be like, oh, you guys fucked up. I'm going to need a lot of options. And we're going to take all these issues very, very seriously. I mean, to last thing on this, to, to come back to something specific so you, you don't think I'm just, this is some sort of personal animus or anything, because, I, look, I, I want I like Obama. I, I you know I go after his policies all the time, but I want him to succeed. Mm -hmm. I desperately want him to turn around, right? And I think he can. I, I'm like the rest of the country. I think he's a good guy, right? Mm -hmm. He looks like a good guy. It seems like he intends well, right? So, but the, the example I'm using is, man, if before I made those momentous decisions in the beginning of my term on finance, right? I don't mean the financial reform package. That took forever anyway, right? But right in the beginning, what are you going to do with TARP? Are you going to give the money to the banks, et cetera? I remember he had one meeting with Krugman, Stiglitz, et cetera, right? One meeting with all of the, the rest of the spectrum? I mean, you meet with Summers and Geithner a million times, I presume, I hope, okay? And the, what do other people think? He had a dinner. And he, you remember, this is when I began to honestly lose a little respect for him. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan Alter wrote the book, a very flattering book overall of Obama, defends Obama in a lot of ways. But in that book, he, he said, in that meeting, Obama said, oh, I don't want to worry about the past, and I want you to skip the details. And I was like, whoa, that's Bushian. Okay, I mean, what do you mean skip the past? Well, how do, you, how do we get in this trouble? How can I tell you if I skip the past, right? Skip the details? What, you got somewhere to go, buddy? Okay, I mean, what do you mean skip the details, right? So that, that was disconcerting, and I, that's why I'm having the vibe that I do on these trips and vacations, et cetera. Now, I've taken this topic pretty in a serious direction, mm -hmm. but all right, that's enough on that. Now let's get back. If the job description were what do you do, <laughs> it's decision maker. Decision maker. <laughs> Every time we play a Bush clip, I think, well, as bad as it gets with Obama, it ain't that bad. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, what's next?
All right. Uh, Elin has g given People magazine uh, an exclusive interview where she has broken her silence about her divorce from Tiger Woods. And it's interesting because she, you haven't heard anything about her. So it's, it's interesting to hear what she has to say now. And basically, she wants everyone to know that she's not violent and she didn't beat Tiger Woods with a bat. Okay? <laughs> she, she said the opposite of this. What to do? You take them out of the office and hit them with a stick a couple of times. They will do. She said, I did not do. <laughs> I did not beat him with a stick a couple of times. Right. She claims that they got into uh, an argument. He got into his car. And, you know, when he hadn't come back for a while, she went outside and saw that he was locked inside a car unconscious and she did everything to get him out so she never hit him with the bat or anything like that um, and then she gives a quote she says I've been through hell um, it's hard to think that you have this life and then all of a sudden was it a lie you're struggling because it wasn't real but I survived it was hard but it didn't kill me okay that's fair that's mm -hmm. good uh, comment I going back to the part where you know she Ran out to the car. She said, I didn't beat him with a stick. I just rough talked him and run him off. <laughs> I think that's almost exactly what happened, actually. And then come to find out he crashed into a fire hydrant after that rough talking. <laughs> so uh, so she, she's upset, understandably. So right. she says she's embarrassed. She says she's Most embarrassed. Most normal thing in the world. Yeah, I felt stupid as more things were, were, were revealed. How could I have known anything, How, not known anything? The, world, the word betrayal isn't strong enough. I felt like my whole world had fallen apart. It seemed like my whole world, as I thought it was, had never existed. So she, she claims that she had no idea, no idea at all that he was sleeping with all these women. Didn't even suspect him of cheating, which I find amazing. It, it, we're going to get to whether that's true or not. Uh-oh. Uh, but, of course, the reason she's saying that is because she doesn't want people to think, Oh, I was just sitting at home taking a paycheck, you know, like, oh, I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, hey, it's Tiger Woods. He's famous. He's rich. I'm rich. I'm going to have a couple of kids. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, he's running away, running around with the Hooters girl and the good girl with David Borneas or whatever his name is. <laughs> okay. Uh, so she said, no, I didn't know. I didn't know. So that makes sense that that's, she would say that. Now, do we believe her? Go. I think it's nearly impossible for you to not even suspect that he's cheating when, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I could understand if he's having like one affair with one individual and he's really, really good about covering up his tracks, but he was having affairs with multiple women for several years. So I, you have to at least suspect it. Did she know the specifics? Of course not. I don't think so. But right. I'm sure. Well, I she... mean, I don't think she knew. Like, oh, and then they took it over the table. Then they went under the no, table. No, but I'm saying the specifics as to did she know who the women were? You right. know, did she know when they would meet up? Like things like that. I don't. Right. I don't... Did he have a hole in one or a hole in three or whatever it might be? I don't think there's a golf term hole in three. Uh, Jerry Jackson, do you believe her? I have never believed her. Oh, really? I, I don't know. I mean, I, of course, who knows who this lady is? Um, I don't think it's possible that you get with an athlete especially of this caliber most famous one of the most famous athletes in the world and you just like eh, yeah, no, yeah but he plays golf <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying like if you're dating a football player you know the guys baseball player they're traveling across the country 162 games they're cheating on you okay a golfer i mean when's the last time a golfer got laid he travels right <laughs> apparently to tiger all, and all apparently over the world <laughs> right. yeah I, I, and the thing is and i don't want to sound like i'm i'm saying oh yeah she you know, she did it for that or had it coming and all that stuff. But you know what you're getting yourself into. I mean, you're not that dumb. Yeah, you know what? I think we're going to need the Chief Justice on this one because I'm going to go not guilty on this one. Because, look, you know, she, did she suspect something? Probably. You know, there's a lot of cell phone calls. There's a lot of text messages when he's home, et cetera. But we don't, I don't think we have enough evidence to say she definitely knew. And that's a pretty harsh thing, right? So I'm going not guilty. You seemed kind of in the middle. Yeah, I'm in the middle. I, I think that she at least suspected it. All right, Chief Justice Goodoy, settle it for us. Did she or did she not know? As much as I want to believe that she did, I, it's too hard. I don't know. I guess I'm being naive in that sense, too. That I mean, she probably suspected, but then not for sure. All right. Yeah. There we go. A surprising not guilty verdict by the TYT Supreme Court. Elon, uh, we pardon you.
For what? She's the one who got cheated on. Poor girl. We're the worst. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we're going to say you didn't know. You might have yeah, suspected a little bit, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And by the way, even if you did know, it's still not your fault. It's yeah, his fault. Of course. Don't of get course. us wrong. By the okay. way, just to add one more thing to it. It is possible that she suspected something, but she was too afraid to find out what the real truth was. And she Happens didn't, all the time. And she didn't investigate it. I mean, I could totally see myself doing that. Like... I think he's cheating, but I'd rather not know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until that evidence is, like, showered on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? That's interesting. Showered on you. And you know what? Unfortunately, that's totally what happened to Gilly. Exactly. You're like, Hooters girl. It wasn't a Hooters girl. Who was some other restaurant, right? A, a Perkins rest girl. Perkins. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Borny ass. Da, da, da. <laughs> Borny ass. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> anyway. But, you know, that happens, actually. And it, there's a fork in the road. And when... Some women, when they think they're getting cheated on, it happens with guys too, of course. Uh, they think some go, eh, I don't want to know. Right. Okay, I'm going to avoid all that stuff. And others go, Oh, I'm going to come in. I'm going to figure out your password, motherfucker. I'm going to look through <laughs> right. your email. I'm your text coming to messages. your email. I'm coming to your text. I'm coming to your phone. I'm going to your Facebook. Okay. Yeah. I'm coming for you. You know, that reminds me, like the women that are in denial or the men that are in denial, it reminds me of that one song that goes, like, I don't want to know if you play in me. Keep it on the low. Keep it on the low, yeah. Okay, please stop. Okay, next story. <laughs> Mercifully. Okay. All right, go. All right. Heidi Montag says that she wants to get rid of her uh, G-cup boobies. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, th first of all, uh, go ahead. You tell me what I told you. Uh, I said that I'm not against all of her plastic surgeries. She's a Barbie doll. She came out. I think she looked better before any of them began. But I get that she's mental, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But I said when she went to G-Cup that that was crazy. And it wasn't going to do her any good. That she looks ridiculous. She looks less attractive. Yes. Right? Right. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with her appearance. The reason why she's tired of her breasts is because uh, she's having a hard time working out. And she's saying that they're painful. And this is, in my opinion, the worst of all. She has to constantly get custom-made clothes made for her. <laughs> no, wait, like you can't you can't go to the mall and have a good time and buy a pretty dress like you have to have some person design clothes for you every single time well I feel her pain because like my nephew will tell me hey Jenk why don't you wear this or kind of clothing or that kind of clothing it looks better right like a v-neck like a tight v-neck <laughs> oh my god uh, okay. disaster <laughs> okay no, no no yeah tight v-neck is really cool if you're hanging out in miami and you know and you're in good shape and you know you got the situation going on if you're the conversation tight v-neck ain't gonna do you any good <laughs> so i feel heidi's pain there you know right. that you got to go get you know kind of clothes because i go through a lot of clothes to, to make me look a little less fat and that's life that's keeping it real right mm -hmm. now but the other thing here is she's addicted she's addicted to plastic surgery mm -hmm. and so i think that's also part of this so she's thinking, oh, now they're a little too large. No, I got to do it again. I got to do it again. And you know, her doctor randomly just died. Her yeah. plastic surgeon, Dr. Frank Ryan, died kind of young. Happened very recently. Yeah, he died uh, after a hike in Malibu. He was driving and he drove off uh, the, I think, PCH. And his car flipped and uh, he died, but his dog miraculously survived. Wow. Um, you know, people will drive me crazy on stories like that. They'll be like, you know, wasn't it a miracle the dog survived? <laughs> Well, how about the guy? How, how, the miracle would have been they don't crash. They both live. They go home, have a sandwich. <laughs> okay. But anyway, one more thing on, on Heidi. Uh -huh. uh, she's going to go down to South America to get the surgery. Disaster. It's got disaster written all over it. Not now, allowed. Now, look, they get a lot of great plastic surgeons in South America. I don't want to denigrate the South No, America. I don't believe it. No, no, they do. Are I'm you kidding, kidding me? Okay. <laughs> Argentina, Venezuela, Chile, believe me, they got a lot of plastic surgeons down there, right? Uh, but why is she going to South America? It's a big country, America. You know, I know, George Bush told me, big country, right? Uh, there's some chance she's banned. Like, surgeons up here are like, no, 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 you've got a mental condition, mm -hmm. and we can't keep doing plastic surgery on you. Like, they, there's no ban across the country, right? But she can't get a decent doctor here to work on her because they think it's crazy and they won't do it. Right. So that's why she's headed for massive trouble if yeah. she keeps this up. By the way, she wants to switch out her G-cup for double Ds. It's fair. It's reasonable. That's the only thing I agree with. I mean, you don't want to go crazy and come down to, like, Bs or anything. Right? Double D, that's fair. I think, I think, okay, in my personal opinion, I don't know. And I'm a woman, so my personal opinion doesn't matter. 
but like a 36B I think is cute, or even a 32C. Yeah, like, we're why, why do you have to go gigantic? No, no, we're, we're not going for cute here. Okay, okay we're going for double D. Okay. okay. <laughs> the decision is final. All right, decision is made. <laughs> okay, by the way, don't get me wrong, I enjoy the C, it's God bless. Uh, I enjoy the B. From time to time I've enjoyed an A. Okay, but if you're going to be Heidi Montag and a celebrity and you're going to throw your tits around it all over the camera, they got to be at least double D. You know, I've been against the, tr the her triple G or whatever she's doing. I was against that all the way. But, you know. I'm Are the you most not merciful? I'm yeah. the most reasonable man in America. Double D makes sense. Okay. <laughs> now we can take a break, come back with more goofy stories. We still haven't gotten to the fetish. Oh, disastrous tours of Mexico. There's so many good stories today. Just calm down and come back.